Yes, it's John G. Sutton. Tales from the Jails. We're talking today about uh, people who self-injure and attempt suicide or even succeed in suicide in prisons because the prevalence uh, of this, uh, certainly at some jails, uh, specifically one was known as Grizzly Risley. Now, Grizzly Risley is a remand centre near Warrington in uh, what was Lancashire, but is now obviously a part of some dodged up really different county that they've got it, but it was in Lancashire, Grizzly Risley. And a lot of people in Risley were hanging themselves. The, the, they decided that the regime was not for them, and so they had to opt for one on the other side. Now, the normal way of hanging yourself is by tying cords or stripped off ripped blankets to the uh, bars on the cell windows, which is an unpleasant way to die, I believe, you know, because you don't die by the traditional way of falling through a trapdoor and breaking your neck. What happens is you start to choke to death. Now, I've been to a number of, uh, of suicides at strange ways where people have done this and uh, usually they find that they get themselves into this position where they're going to attempt suicide and then three quarters way through it they decide that they're not going to want like this too much and try to get out but by which time the cords have tightened around their necks and they choke to death which is I believe quite a painful death not one to be recommended, and certainly I don't recommend anybody attempting to kill themselves at all. I mean, because it's not for you to decide when your journey's over. You're here for a purpose. And the other thing is, there is no death. I know there is no death because I have had two near-death experiences. I'll briefly tell you about one of them. The first one I had when I was, when I was just joined the army. I was in uh, Germany, and I'd only been there a short while. It was December, quite early December in 1968. <clears throat> and uh, there was a flu going round. It was a version of the Spanish flu. And uh, I managed to get it. So I reported sick, went to the doctor. The doctor said, you are, you've got very high temperature. You've obviously got this flu. He said, uh, I'm going to send you to hospital. I said, I oh, don't send me to hospital, you know. Just let me, I'll be all right in, in the barrack room, you know. So I should have gone to hospital. But uh, I said, oh, all right. He said, all right, well, if, if you're... Your bunkmates, the people who live in the barrack, will look after you, you know, bring you, make sure you get food. I said, I'm sure they will, but of course I was delirious, you know, I didn't know what I was saying. So when I got back <clears throat> into the barrack room, <clears throat> I told the sergeant major in charge of the of the, of the unit, you know, exactly what was, what was wrong. And he looked at the sick report, he said, all right, we'll go to bed. He said, I'll get the your, your, your barrack room mates to bring you food which they didn't. They thought I was they thought I was having a laugh. In actual fact, I was dying. It was that bad. I didn't know. But anyway, I think it was the second night and I had had nothing to eat and don't think they'd even brought me anything to drink. They just left me slumped in the bed. Thought I was skiving, you see. And uh, I had this experience where I wasn't in the I wasn't in bed in my body I was out of my body and a voice said to me come with me come with me John and, and I, 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 I moved I don't know how I moved but I moved and they said right where would you like to go and I said oh, anyway you, this, you can go anywhere you want I said I'd like to see the Taj Mahal I was at the Taj Mahal seriously looking around the, outside the Taj Mahal and they said, is there anywhere else you'd like to go? I said, I'd like to see uh, the Eiffel Tower. Seriously. Next thing, I'm up on the platform at the top of the Eiffel Tower, walking around with all the, all, lots of other people, looking around at the Eiffel Tower, and I was there. Yeah. And then they said to me, where would you like, where would you like to go? Now this voice, just at the side of me, I couldn't see anybody, but it was a big voice. 
and it was a man's voice, said, where would you want to be? It sounded benevolent, you know. And I said, I'd like to go and see my grandparents. And uh, my grandparents were alive, and they lived in a place called Fall Ridge, which is a little town the other side of Colne, near Burnley, in Lancashire. So I remember coming in, I was moving in, in, in another dimension, <clears throat> but I was above the clouds and coming down. It was like being Superman, you know. And I came to Earth about half a mile from my grandparents' house. And it felt like I weighed about 10 tonnes. I could hardly walk. I couldn't move, you know. And uh, a lady came to me, a beautiful lady with long dark hair, all in white, and said to me, uh, You've got a choice, John. Do you want to go on and see your grandparents? Or do you want to go back to your body? You know, she said to me very nicely, very politely, very beautiful, very warm, very friendly. And I said, <clears throat> no, I'm, I'll go back to my body. I will go back. Uh, and uh, she said, take my hand. And I reached out and seriously, I took her hand. And the next thing, I'm back in, in my body. But I wasn't in bed. I was on the floor. I'd fallen out of the bed and I was on the floor next to the radiator. And it was freezing cold in that barrack room. Anyway, I woke up and I was I was out. The fever had gone and I, I got better. But the thing is, what would have happened if I'd taken another journey? If I'd said, oh, no, I'm going to go and see my grandparents, you know? Where would I have been? <laughs> Wouldn't have been back in my body, would I? Yeah. So there is no death. It's a strange place. But listen, anyway, this idea of killing yourself in jail. Uh, lots of inmates were attempting to slash their wrists, you know, across there. Cut the wrists. Useless. What happens is you, you cut through the artery, but because as you lose blood, you lose quite a lot of blood. I reckon you'd probably lose about three, maybe four pints, but your body holds eight pints. And slowly, as the blood pressure drops, as you lose all the blood, it, it, the cuts on your wrist, they, 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 they seize up, you know, they, they just drop. So they don't, you don't lose enough blood by cutting your wrist like that. The only success I ever saw with anybody cutting the wrists was when they cut them along the artery, right down there, yeah? That's not a tip on how to kill yourself, by the way. That's an observation that I had. And I saw a number of people who had done that. There was a spate in strange ways uh, of cell fires. A rumour went round, a ridiculous rumour, that if you were involved in a cell fire and survived, then you got six months off your sentence. It was utter nonsense. And uh, people were setting fire to the cells, and hopefully they would... Uh, get themselves six months off the sentence because they didn't a number of them died and the the fires were it wasn't just the fire that did it was the mattresses were made out of a sponge form that when ignited when it was a light it gave off a kind of gas uh, like a a poisonous gas and that's what killed the prisoners not the fire although the fire would be burning extremely hot and we couldn't go in because it was burning that hot we had to smash through the Judas hole <coughs> smash through and put a hose pipe through the Judas hole and blast it blast the cells full of water we went to one cell where there had been a cell fire and uh, there was three inmates in there two of them had obviously decided that they wanted to start this cell fire and the third one didn't and we found him strapped to a chair in the cell they tied him up and ignited the uh, the cell so that, that 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 killed them all yeah but not a very happy event believe me and seeing things like that kind of create a post-traumatic stress disorder which i suffer from i keep having visions of myself waking up at four if i wake up at four in the morning three in the morning i'm dreaming nightmares 
that I'm walking the landings of strange ways and there's nobody there, just me, walking the cells, walking around the cells. That's a terrible nightmare. Anyway, I'm going to sing you a song. You deserve it, you know. It's not singing, is it, eh? But somebody complained that their wife was saying that this was a horrible sound. Where was it coming from? Madam, you're looking at the source of a sublime sound. And this is a song, well, it's not going to be much of a song, is it? This is called Big Bad John. It's got nothing to do with me, by the way. But here we go. Every morning at the mine, you could see him arrive. He stood six foot six and weighed 245. Kind of broad at the shoulder and narrow at the hip. And everybody knew you didn't give no lip to Big John. Big John, Big Bad John. Nobody seemed to know where John called home. He just drifted into town and stayed all alone. He didn't say much, kind of quiet and shy. And if he spoke at all, it was just to say hi, Big John. Big John, Big Bad John. Somebody said he came from New Orleans, where he got in a fight over a Cajun queen. And a crashing blow from a huge right hand sent a Louisiana fella to the promised land, Big John. Big John, Big Bad John. Then came the day at the bottom of the mine when a timber cracked and men started crying. Miners were dying, and the hearts beat fast, and everybody thought they had breathed their last, said John. Big John, Big Bad John. Through the dust and the smoke of this man-made hell walked a giant of a man that the miners knew well, grabbed a sagging timber, gave out with a groan, and made like a giant oak tree, stood there all alone. Big John, Big John, Big Bad John. And with all his strength, he gave a mighty shove. Then a miner yelled out, there's a light up above. And 20 men scrambled from a would-be grave. Now there's only one down there to save Big John. Big John, Big Bad John. With jacks and timbers they started back down, then came a rumble way down in the ground. Smoke and gas belched out of that mine, and everybody knew it was the end of the line for Big John. Big John, Big Bad John. No, they never reopened that worthless pit. They just placed a marble stand in front of it. These few words are written on that stand. At the bottom of this mine lies a big, big man. Big John. Big John. Big bad John. There you go. Tales from the Jails. I hope you enjoyed that. Don't forget, like, 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 clicky like, and subscribe. See ya.